Hello, River Valley Church at Home. Thanks so much for joining us today. And then we're gonna be taking a little break from our values series to uh, take a look at what is going on in our world today. Uh, we, we're in a very chaotic time in our, in our culture and, and, and Pastor Mark wanted to address that. So uh, thanks for taking some time with us as we, as we open up um, some, some scripture as it relates to that topic. Hey, if you have any questions about uh, today's message, uh, reach out to our Digging Deeper uh, podcast. The, the link will be below, so make sure that you're asking questions that you'd like to be discussed by our pastoral team. Hey, we got a few quick announcements for you. Check out the River Valley Week. Hey church, Eric Swan here. I'm one of your youth pastors at River Valley. Welcome to the weekly. I got a couple of announcements for you guys. First announcement, and this is probably one of the most important announcements for this week. We have the Pregnancy Care Center Baby Bottle Drive. Now, what you may be wondering, what is this drive? Well, this little bottle, what we're asking you guys to do is fill it up with change, uh, bills, large checks, you know, whatever you guys want. And all of this money that's gonna be filled in here is gonna go back to support our local pregnancy care center, which is one of the most amazing ministries that we have uh, locally in town. Uh, once this is all filled up to the brim, so maybe that's cutting back a little, you know, a couple coffees during the week, I don't know, you know, whatever you feel you need to do, uh, give this full bottle back to your campus. Now, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard that we have a new campus opening up in Sunny Valley, which we're all really excited about at River Valley. Now. Next weekend here at the downtown campus, Sunday, we're having an informational meeting. So if you guys are wondering, hey, I mean, I wanna be part of the startup team, or I just want more information on what this new campus looks like, then this meeting is gonna be for you. So make sure you show up. Details are gonna be in the program for you. Another announcement for you guys, January 24th is our Right to Life Prayer March. Um, we'd love to see as many of you there as possible. We have details that are gonna be in the program for you, so check that out. Lastly, you guys, we have a really cool opportunity. On January 30th, we're gonna be having a worship and prayer night. Uh, that's Saturday, January 30th. And, and this is just, the heart of this is about you know, with all the turmoil going on in our nation, with all the things that are just so crazy surrounding us, just a time where we can focus our hearts and surrender that to the Lord. So it's a real special opportunity that we have as a church. Um, also that weekend, we will have baptisms as well. So if the Lord's been tugging on your heart about that, um, then please get a hold of Pastor Rob. We'd love to be able to set you up um, to be baptized that weekend too. Well, hey guys, that's all the announcements I had for you guys. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you guys next week. We'll see you later. Lord, we're honored to come here today in your presence, Lord. Uh, we're thankful for how you care for us. And so, God, we want to come and say thank you. In every moment, in every way, God, we want to lift up our prayers in song form today. And so receive our adoration, receive our praise. We pray this in your name. Amen. God. 
can stop the Lord Almighty? Who 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 can stop the Well, change of plan for today. What we were going to do is talk about our value series and our third uh, value. Uh, that was the plan, but we're going to do that next week. And uh, let me tell you what happened. I was out of town some of last week and last weekend. And so I, like you, saw the madness that was taking place there in uh, Washington, uh, D.C., the riots there at the Capitol. And so when I got back, I had to stop and ask myself the question as I was thinking about this uh, weekend. Uh, Lord, do you want us to stay with the series uh, values or should we uh, step into this situation that we're seeing in our uh, culture and our nation and uh, address this mess uh, that we are witnessing playing out before us? If you've been in our church for a while, you know we rarely do this. We, we typically just stick with the Bible. We think that the Bible is what matters most and we don't typically, you know, hit the cultural issue of the week. Uh, but in, in this situation and thinking about what's going on and how important it is that we speak truth into this situation. And so I was thinking we should probably do something special and focus on this. I asked our leadership team, our elders and pastors to really think through this and pray through it and give me some counsel. And, and I got a lot of confirmation and affirmation and support uh, from them. And uh, so that's what we're going to do uh, today. The other campus pastors are doing the same thing. In fact, I would encourage you to get a well-rounded perspective on this topic and listen in on what they have to say on the podcast there. Even the digging deeper this week, I think, is going to be really critical as we all get together and chew on this uh, even more. Um, so uh, let's get into this. It kind of reminds me of what a friend of mine used to say, Dar Wolber, who now lives in Medford, used to be on staff here, one of my friends. And, and he used to say to, hey, Mark, uh, I'm with you, win or tie. That's <laughs> sort of how I feel uh, here today, but excited to share this and trusting the Lord. So here's what happened uh, in me personally. When I saw the events there taking place at the Capitol and then what's taken place over this last week, I have experienced this full range of emotions uh, like you, I'm sure, uh, anger, disappointment, almost like a sick to my stomach feeling, a sorrow, uh, a disgust, even an anxiety, just this combination of things. And of course, 
uh, this stuff's been happening in me all year, like you. Uh, a lot of riots, a lot of cities on fire. Uh, the chaos of the COVID pandemic that doesn't seem to be going away, extreme racial tension that we see. Uh, and I'm just thinking to, myself, thinking to myself, like how in the world are 13 year olds gonna, gonna, gonna do with this? How are they doing uh, with this wave after wave of crisis and, and riots? I mean, 13 is scary enough, like without all this on top of it. And uh, you know, what's it doing to the church and what's it doing to our families and, and our, our community? What will things be like after uh, all of this? And so that's been happening all year. And then like, bam, like a knockout blow, uh, the, the, the events of this last uh, week, uh, insurrection, mob violence at the Capitol, uh, people storming inside, uh, gallows set up, I, I guess for Vice President Pence, uh, People killed, uh, including a police officer. Uh, now uh, impeachment 2.0, uh, a president for first time in history impeached uh, twice. Uh, we have National Guard troops sleeping in the US Capitol uh, at night because of the threat of more violence and the threat at all 50 state capitals all over the nation uh, for the upcoming um, uh, inauguration and, and violence and resistance uh, that, that, that may take place. At least there's the threat uh, of that. So, so yeah, it's probably a good topic to address this uh, mess and to get God's word and heart on this issue. So I want to try to keep it simple. I'm a pretty simple person and uh, I don't claim to be an authority on these topics, but I do want to just answer two, try to address two simple questions. Number one, why did this happen? And number two, what should we do about it as God's people? So first, why did this happen? And to answer this question, I, I think we can start on the more obvious level. There's a bunch of people in our country who don't trust uh, the results of this election. They don't trust the electoral uh, process, maybe believe in widespread voter fraud, uh, maybe don't uh, trust the elected officials. Now, this is not new. In the year 2000, 82% uh, of Democrats felt that George Bush stole the election. And in 2016, 66% of Democrats believed Russia hacked in and altered, affected uh, that election where Trump stole it in 2016. And now, obviously here 2020, 67% of Republicans believe the election was rigged and that Biden stole uh, the election. So um, that's one of the obvious reasons why this is all happening. In addition to this, you have a country that's more divided than ever and people frustrated. People are uh, angry, afraid, disillusioned at what is going on in our country and certainly that's understandable. In addition to this, you have a numerous conspiracy theories like, like all over the place, right? Uh, where, where there's all this fuel for, for unrest, right? Better get your guns, your ammo, your food, stockpile, all that kind of stuff. Now, personally, I don't do well with conspiracy theories. That's just me, it might be you. I, I, my wiring isn't that uh, uh, at all. I mean, if people start talking to me about their particular conspiracy theory, I kind of start to glaze over and I start thinking about something more important like, you know, what am I gonna have for lunch? You know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, it's just me. Uh, I'm sure some conspiracy theories are probably true, but that's just, that's just where, where I'm at. So that's a reason for, for some of this. Another reason that this has happened, and this is just my opinion, but, but I'm disappointed in the actions of our president. It, it grieves uh, me that he didn't do more to prevent this. It seems that potentially he's more concerned about the victory and his personal ambition than what's best for the country. And, and a, a vital, peaceful transition for the president-elect. Now, he certainly has uh, the, the, I mean, I, I voted for Trump. He certainly has the right to question the election results and pursue court action. But at some point, he has to be able to say, like we all have learned those two hard words, I lost. And, and let's do what's best uh, for the country. With great power comes great responsibility. And his actions have been disappointing to me. That's my opinion. So that's a reason 
And then there's another reason that's a little more complex, but I'll, I'll just quickly touch on it. And it's this, this notion, and really it's a silly notion, uh, that America is a Christian nation. The, the more accurate term is, is uh, Christian nationalism. And, that's, and that, that's a big term, but one of the definitions is that America was founded as a Christian nation, and it needs to stay that way. And so that's one of the reasons why you have people storming the Capitol, like uh, last week, um, and, or two weeks ago, and they've got their Christian flags, or their Jesus saves banners, or Jesus and Trump on the same uh, banner. And there's this mixture of, of the two. Now, it's very good that our nation, praise God, was built on uh, biblical principles. It's great that so many Americans are Christians, but it's incorrect to say that we are a Christian nation. And the reason is because no nation makes you a Christian. Like a nation is defined, it's a geopolitical reality with borders, populations, and governments. And a Christian is someone who says, I am a personal believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as my savior. Like no nation can do that. There's no, really no such thing as a Christian uh, nation. There can be many Christians in a nation and there could be a nation that's abiding by some biblical principles, but, but not, not Christian uh, nation. The church is distinct from America, right? And, and there's no theocracy until King Jesus returns. So Christian nationalism says, well, me and Jesus... We're going to go fight for our country. We're going to go storm the Capitol. We're going to take matters into our own hands. And the ends justifies the means. And it's so tragic because it's just complete ignorance of what the Bible says and the ethic of Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. And, and we'll, get, we'll get into that more in just, just a minute. Now, I just want to be clear. I call myself a Christian patriot, not a Christian nationalist, but I'm a Christian patriot, which means that I love my country. Patriots uh, are good citizens, pay our taxes, vote, defend our country uh, when uh, necessary. Christian patriot for sure. So those are some of the reasons, maybe more the obvious reasons why uh, these things have happened. But let's go deeper. Here's a scripture. Check this out. James 4, 1. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to, make, to take it away from them. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Once again, the Bible for the win. Like, like that, that is just... Right on. Painfully true, but right on. There's a real explanation deeper for what's going on. It's the evil desires in people's hearts, including mine and, and, and yours, right? Where does anger and rage and fights and argument, where does all that come from? Very clear here. From our own hearts. Like nobody can make you like angry. Like they could trigger it, right? It's kind of like tea bag, right? You put the tea bag in hot water. The hot water kind of pulls it out, but it was in the tea all along. And so this stuff is in us. It's deep. And what we need to do when we get angry, whenever it might be, is like, hey, where, where's that coming from? And deal with what's, you know, take personal responsibility for our own anger and our, rather than finger, oh, they made me angry. They're this, they're, you know, how come I'm feeling this way? What's going, how did it pull this out inside of me? So that's a deeper reason right there. And here's another deeper reason. I'll give you one more. We have a front row seat at what happens when people want the kingdom without the king. People want this, this kingdom. This, what we're seeing is this devolution of a, of a culture that wants the kingdom. And what I mean by that is freedom, identity, prosperity, happiness, human flourishing. But they don't want the real Jesus, not the Jesus of the Bible his salvation, his lordship, his ethic. And when you want the kingdom without King Jesus, then we're going to do some really stupid things. Like as, 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 as tragic as all this is, it's really not surprising of what can happen when people want, want it their way without Jesus and his way. So that's my best attempt to explain how we got here why this all happened. 
But maybe here's a better question, number two, what should we do, right? I love this verse in Psalm 11:3. It's totally for today as much as then. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's a good question. And it's all on fire, you know, on both sides. And, and it's like, what, what can the righteous do? So let, let me get into some biblical things. And one of the things I love about the Bible is, is uh, it's just so amazing because it reminds us that nothing's new under the sun. Like the people of God have been here before. Maybe not specifically this, but, but something uh, uh, like it. And, and, and so God always has truth uh, for us. And, and so here's the first thing. Condemn all violence. And I know that sounds obvious, but, but it goes without saying, but I have to say it. Like even if you believe that the election was stolen, like even if you believe that the new administration could be the kiss of death for America. Like even if you believe that, I hope you agree with me that never justifies violence, never justifies trying to take matters into our own hands. And, and these riots, and just like the riots that we've seen throughout the, the year in different cities, they've got nothing to do with Jesus, okay? No one who assaulted the Capitol was following the teachings of Jesus. On the contrary, those types of behaviors grieve the heart of Jesus. Remember when soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter took his sword out and he hacked off that guy's ear? He was probably going for his head. And Jesus picked the guy's ear up off the ground and put it back on his head and healed him. And then Jesus rebuked Peter and he said, put away your sword. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Jesus like, Peter, this is not my play. This is not my, this is not my plan to, to, be, to go doing this. In fact, Jesus would say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they're called the children of God. We're told to submit to the governing authorities, Romans 13, to pray for those who are in uh, positions of authority, 1 Timothy 2. And this doesn't mean we're going to agree with everything that they say and do. And when we don't agree, praise God, we live in a country where there's a democratic process and we can go through that process, not attack it with violence. So it was Chuck Colson, the late Chuck Colson, who said it this way, people who cannot restrain their own baser instincts, who cannot treat one another with civility, are not capable of self-government. Without virtue, a society can be ruled only by fear, a truth that tyrants understand all too well. It's so true. Here's a second thing that we can do. Choose the Lord's side. In other words, I want to suggest a third team. Now, the, this is very hard for us because the easiest thing to do in times like this, in fact, it's almost impossible to not choose a side. Left, right, you know, Democrat, Republican. There's basically two parties, for the, essentially, for the most part, the majority in, in our country. And... And most of us align with one or the other. Nothing wrong with that. We have our personal reasons uh, uh, for that. But regardless on which camp you're in or libertarian or independent, whatever, um, you can find all the support that you want for your position, right? I mean, you know that. Websites, uh, bloggers, cable news, even pastors, even Bible verses, that can be taken to support uh, your particular team or tribe or um, ideology. On top of that, and I don't quite understand all this, but there's a whole system set up to keep you in your echo chamber. There's algorithms that are designed to make sure that what you see on your web browser, social media, is exactly what you already want to believe in and hear. And this, this would be similar to, you know, uh, you shop for something online and all of a sudden you're getting all these ads, you know, on the side of, uh, that, that are the same thing. Like, I don't know, who's figuring that all out? Well, it's a system that's keeping you in your particular echo chamber, which, by the way, is why things like, you know, cable news, say Fox on the right, CNN on the left. And when you have a host that, that makes a really bold but true statement that's outside of their particular creed, all right, they get demonized and they lose a huge percentage of viewers just because they told the truth. Well, 
what I'm tempted to do, I don't have the time, and I, we're gonna talk about this in Digging Deeper, is talk about the whole principle of how do you get wisdom? How do you understand discernment? Like, how do you know who to even believe today? It's crazy. Everyone's an expert, a blogger, everyone has a platform, and a lot of conspiracy stuff going on out there, and how do you know? And there's such a gullibility um, that, that, that we're seeing today in, in people. Um, but this idea of a third team, and, and where, where I got that is I was pondering this principle, amazing scripture in Joshua chapter five. And uh, God commands Joshua and the Israelites to go into the land of Canaan and just, and just take it, take it. The Canaanites were so bad. I, I mean, they, they had, a, had an evil and a corruption that we don't even see today. That's how bad that, that, they, that, that they were, okay? So God's like, you just gotta wipe them all out. And, and so, and so this, is, this is what happens as Joshua is headed there. Verse 13, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his, hat, in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what's the message that my Lord has for his servant? Okay, so this is like a powerful angel, um, a manifestation of the, the, a servant of the Lord, a, a messenger of God. And it's such a strange question. Joshua's like, hey, you on our side or their side? Because we know that God has told Joshua, commanded him to go and do this thing. For, you know? And so, you, oh yeah, God's on Joshua's side for sure, which makes this answer so bizarre, right? That yes, God had commanded Israel to do that, but really it says, I'm on a third team, right? And there's right and there's wrong on both sides because they're humans. Uh, sometimes there's more right than wrong on a particular side. But, but God is very clear here, and he says, or this messenger of God says, I am on uh, the, the Lord's side. I don't ultimately take sides. I want God's side. So it's that third place that we have a real hard time with because we're so like divided and we're so polarized uh, today. But it helps us understand the bigger kingdom, that something bigger and much greater and forever is being created and built and, and a real king, all right? So we're talking that Jesus is our hope always, always has been, always will be, should be in your life and mine, not any president, not any president-elect, not any government or political party. Jesus is our only hope. And, and if we haven't learned that lesson by now, like, man, we're the biggest fools ever. If we don't really get the fact that we need Jesus and his hope, there's a reason that he's called King of Kings. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Chuck Colson used to say, No Savior will ever show up on Air Force One. Okay, it's not going to happen. All right? It, Jesus is the only Savior. So riots and protests and tribalism and polarization, that's what happens when people want the kingdom without the king. And my hope, and I hope yours, is in the Lord. My tribe is, is Jesus. I might have a particular political affiliation, right? But that is not my tribe. My tribe is Jesus and what he wants because with him is complete truth and hope. And the Bible is filled with these amazing stories of people who have this hope in the most horrendous hardship and persecution I mean, people getting their teeth kicked in by the culture, persecuted by governments, and there's a joy and a gladness that they have because they have hope that's greater than this life, and that surpasses a peace that all understands, of all understanding. So uh, we're people that when fear comes upon us like it always does, we can push back with faith. Faith triumphs over fear because Jesus, who is truth, says, if you know the truth, it'll set you free. Jesus says we can cast our burdens on him and, and he will give us his peace. The scripture says, you know, why are you downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. So I'm reminded in times like this, especially this world is not our home. Okay, heaven is our true home for the believer, for the follower of Jesus. We have a better country. We have a better citizenship. 
We're called foreigners, we're called aliens, we're called strangers, we're called ambassadors. So we should, we should have this homesick kind of a feeling because we know that our life here is temporary. Nations rise and fall. God says the nations are like a drop in the bucket. But Philippians 3.20 says, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah, we live as, as uh, committed as we can in this culture, all right? Yet we know our real home is in heaven. And we also, because of that, we expect hardship here. We should expect some suffering. It was Bob Goff recently said, Jesus never promised to eliminate all the chaos from our lives. He said he will bring meaning to it. So we should expect persecution. Uh, we're gonna continue as Christians to be demonized. But now we shouldn't contribute to that unnecessarily. We shouldn't, you know, we, we shouldn't go do uh, uh, foolish things and, and lash out at people and try to win arguments and to you know, disagree with, with anger and hatred. Those kind of things don't help us. We, we get persecuted too often for stuff like that. I'm talking about expect the culture to demonize us because of what we believe and because of who uh, we love. And we can do the opposite. We can, we can push back with love. We can be a great listener. Uh, expect hardship. Also, uh, I mean, sin, sin's not going anywhere, right? I, I mean, sin will continue to ravage our planet. A and, and we hope it doesn't, but the Bible paints a very bleak picture of where things are going without Jesus, before Jesus returns. I don't say that as an alarmist or a defeatist, but as a realist, right? Bad things will happen. There's going to be sickness and death and corruption and evil. I mean, you name it. It's because Satan's not locked up yet. He's very much alive and well, having a field day in, in our world. But his, his days are numbered, and King Jesus is coming back. And by the way, people are asking me a lot recently, is this the end? Like, is Jesus coming back soon? And my answer is, I don't know, <laughs> probably, <laughs> right? I mean... This is a good time to be apocalyptic. This is a good time to think about the reality. I mean, the Bible surely predicts this kind of stuff that's going to happen before Jesus returns. Like if there's ever a time when it seems like it's likely, it's now. So yes, keep looking up, man. Be an end times believer. Be excited. Listen for that trumpet call and our... Um, uh, our, our opportunity to go be uh, with the Lord. So yes, absolutely. However, at the same time, I want to caution, caution against being recklessly apocalyptic, where, you know, like every new election that doesn't go your way, uh, it, you know, or every new immoral law um, that, 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 that comes down, that, that just sort of triggers this doomsday kind of prediction, oh, you know, Jesus is coming back now, you know? We got to be careful of those kinds of statements because we, we just kind of end up looking a little kooky, you know, a little weird. I mean, kookier than we really are. <laughs> um, so, 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 yeah, I mean, choose God's team. I'm, I'm encouraged by that. And there's one more thing I think we can do is seize the moment. Number three, this is our time. This is an opportunity as Christians to shine more brightly than ever. This could be our finest hour in front of us. Rather than go all doomsday and be all depressed and bummed out, this is an opportunity in a society with unprecedented fear, anger, rage, loss of hope, we got something to offer. We got something different. We got the real king. We got the real kingdom. It's been said that when the, the room is the darkest is when the light shines the brightest. So the question I have to ask myself and Hopefully you ask yourself is, are we shining brighter? Are we different? So that people would see us and go, man, what is up with them? They do have a peace. They have a love. They are completely, they, they're going against the flow. I hope, that's what the, I hope that's what people see in our lives. Team Jesus, man, great day to be alive. But I want to say this, that whenever, we see this in the Bible, whenever God is preparing for a great work, in the worst of times, what he does is he calls us to repentance. 
And this is kind of backwards and it's hard for us because we want to look outward and be critical and, oh, let's, let's assess and address the mess that's out there rather than what Jesus says, no, there's a lot within us that we can focus on, which we, we have ultimate control, we, we have control over our own, our own lives. Be more concerned about that personal repentance. See, see more concerned about DC or Salem or whatever is, is what about our lives? Like what needs to change you know, in, in our heart? I mean, just like good religious people, we're really good at seeing everybody's, everybody else's sin and problems. Not so good at looking at and dealing with our own. Have we contributed to the unrest by how we've acted on social media? By the way we've talked to somebody who's kind of an opponent you know, at work? Have we experienced some hatred in our heart over a particular person or a group? Have we experienced anger just like raging up within us and we just want to blame it on this or that and then we're not dealing with like our own anger, our own stuff? Do we have a misplaced hope, misplaced God, misplaced savior? We think it's money. We think it's politics. We think it's the next president or what, you know. Do we pray? Like are we praying as we're commanded to? So, I mean, the more I'm an expert on your sin, and not my own, the farther from Jesus I get. So, way more important, and I've said this before, than what's happening in the White House is what's happening in your house and my house. Way more, I mean, because forget DC, forget Salem, and I don't mean that like forget it, you know what I mean. Look at Grants Pass and your heart and your family and this church and this community with our greatest focus and our greatest energy. And so, so just quickly, what that looks like is we're gonna fight hatred with love, right? Have you ever seen more hatred than now? And what did Jesus people do? Love, right? Enemy love, like hard to love people. Loving all people, the protesters on both sides, loving the president, loving the president-elect, uh, loving any and all opponents that we might have out there in our lives, right? Loving them. See, if all we do, if, all we, if we're just about truth but not love, we're just a bully. All we have is a weapon. Truth and love is the combination that we're talking about, and especially with other believers and how we treat each other. Jesus said, John 13, uh, by this the world will know that you're my disciples if you love uh, one another. And I just, I, I tell you, I gotta, I gotta commend the River Valley family and, and, and from my perspective, how, how good this is. I, I've been in life groups, I see people with different political ideologies and different views on things. And, and it's just really cool to see the acceptance of one another and that's exactly the way it should be. It's not uniformity. It's unity. And we're going to be different in some of those secondary issues. Not in the core doctrines, how to be saved and who's God, you know, and, and the core ethics of the New Testament. But, but in those secondary issues, important, but maybe not as clear or not as important, we're going to have to agree to disagree. And so that's just super, super important to have uh, a love that rules uh, in our relationships, inside the church, outside um, the church, really fight against tribalism, which, which idolizes your tribe and demonizes anybody else, just to push back you know, against that and to say, I'm on the Lord's side. And guys, this is, is, this is what we do. We get to love. And, and the other thing this, this includes is hating the real enemy. Friends, people aren't the enemy. Never have been, never will be. Satan is the enemy. Ephesians 6, 12 says, our struggle and our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's those uh, demonic powers and authorities. It's Satan himself and all of his demons. That's our fight. Satan has always been about hatred, violence, lying, selfish ambition, the idolatry of political parties and rulers. And he's having a field day today. So we don't fight people we fight against Satan, and when we fight, we fight with our greatest weapon on our knees, in prayer, right? This is what we see all throughout the Bible. 
in times especially like this we're people of prayer. So my heart is and my challenge is we're praying for our president that he'll do the right thing. We're praying for our vice president, we're praying for our president-elect, okay? Whether you voted for him or not, we're praying uh, for his, his um, uh, for him and we're gonna support him. We're praying for peace and safety as we think about the things that could be happening uh, in our country. We're praying for the end of violence and we're praying for law enforcement. We're praying for a spirit of civility in our uh, differences. We're praying that God will do a miracle uh, in our country. And we're especially praying that he'll build his third team, the true kingdom, Christians, people that uh, say, yes, Jesus, I need you as my si It's not working out there. The kingdom doesn't work without the king. So we're praying that people uh, will come uh, to the Lord. And of course, we're praying uh, for ourselves and dealing with our own issues of spiritual growth and repentance. Uh, like I say a lot, um, there's plenty there to work on, isn't there? I know I have plenty to work on before I do any finger pointing uh, anywhere else. And so, um, guys, that's my heart. Uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to share uh, with you today. A lot, so much uh, that we could talk. I, I want to encourage you with something this week. Uh, picture somebody that you have a hard time loving, maybe an opponent, so to speak, in one of these areas at work, in your family, in your life group, someone on social media. And I want you to pray for them. Would you pray God's blessing on them, that God would reveal himself to them, wherever they might be at spiritually, believer, unbeliever, whatever it might be, just pray that God would touch them. Don't, don't do drive-by ideological bomb on them. Just pray God's goodness and blessing. And then, you know, here's a, a second thing, is maybe just write them a little text or email or next time you see them, say, you know, I've been praying for you. Um, just that God would really bless you. And I just want you to know I do care about you as a person. We may disagree on some of these things, but I really care about you. I encourage you to do that. I uh, close with this story. There, there, I just uh, heard about this in, on the, in the Washington Post, uh, came out with this story, a pastor in Virginia, Robbie Pruitt. And somebody jacked, uh, stole his uh, mountain bike off of his car, his car rack. And uh, so obviously he's pretty upset about that as any of us uh, would be, but the Lord really gave him grace and gave him compassion for the, the criminal, the thief, who he didn't, obviously didn't know who it was. And so uh, what he decided to do is, uh, cause he's pretty good at fixing bikes and, and he just felt a compassion that, you know what, I wanna help people, especially in this hard time of COVID and, and more and more people struggling with poverty. I wanna, I wanna help people who need a bike. So he, uh, put a message out, blasted it out in many different ways that he'll fix any bike in that community for free. And, and he'll take donated bikes and he'll fix them up and he'll give them to people, especially the poor and the underprivileged, and, and, and give them a bike if, if they need it. From September to descend, end of the year, he repaired 140 bikes, all right? <laughs> and he uh, gave 85 bikes to people that needed them, and then he gave the rest back to those who needed them repaired. And I just thought, you know, what a great, what a great story. Like, he could have been mad, and I got my bike ripped off. What's this world coming to? You know what he did? Reminds me of Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Luke 6, 27. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. That's King Jesus. That's our King. That's the kingdom ethic. That's, that's, what we're, that's the only thing that I want us to be thinking about today. And the best news ever is that King Jesus comes to live in us as Christians and he gives us the power. He, he says, I'll, I'll do this through you to live this way in a, in a difficult culture, in a difficult time. So let's pray together. God, for all these things that uh, I just challenged us with and, and, and more importantly, you've challenged us with, our hearts cry out to you. And I pray that our prayer especially would escalate and, and just sitting in uh, the sorrow and the lament of this time as a nation and what's been happening and even people losing their lives. And, and to cry out, Lord, for your grace and mercy upon our nation, starting with us, that you'll work in our lives first and foremost, dealing with the things that we need to deal with, that you'll do miracles in our country, 
that you'll heal our divisive nation and that you'll especially build your third team, the kingdom of God. And so we uh, look to you, we thank you, and we love you. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen.
our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. We sing great, are you? sing great are you Lord Lord we're singing it out and it's just a fact you are great you are worthy of praise so we come and offer it up to you the one who is worthy to receive it all we love you Lord we praise your holy name amen well, hope you are encouraged that Jesus Christ is our hope in, in all the turmoil and craziness that our, our culture is in right now. And if you're in a time where, where you would like prayer, please go to the Connect card, reach out to us, let us know how we can be praying for you and supporting you. Well, River Valley, thanks for joining us and have a great week.